This is Thought Emotion, a series dedicated to the seminars of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Today's video covers lectures two and three and seminar three. Last time we considered Lacan's distinction between the psychoanalytic notion of psychosis as a clinical structure and other conceptions that treat psychosis as a constellation of symptoms. We also considered how to situate psychosis in terms of the imaginary, symbolic, and real, as well as schema L. In the lecture cover today, we'll begin to unpack the clinical structure of psychosis and paranoia more specifically as it pertains to speech. The following questions will be addressed. One, why do we need to bypass understanding to arrive at the clinical structures of psychosis? Two, how do signifier and signified function in delusions? And three, how does delusional discourse express itself through speech? In lecture two, Lacan claims that Various clinical descriptions of psychosis and the various clinical subtypes that were developed in his time and probably in our time as well are notably incorrect and fail to account for the fundamental irreducible and differentiated structures that form the underlying nucleus of psychosis. What precisely are those fundamental structures and how do we arrive at them? For Lacan, the necessary initial attitude is to realize that we don't understand. One of the problems previous approaches have had is situating paranoia, which Lacan places as the exemplary case of psychosis, on the plane of understanding, striking a remarkable parallel to the manifestation of psychotic phenomena itself, whereby the meaning of delusions becomes perfectly understandable to the psychotic subject. The parallel is not all that surprising once we come to realize that all egoic knowledge is paranoia paranoic knowledge, and so we all have our start in the structures of paranoia. To quote Bruce Fink, the origin of the ego in the mirror stage is such that there is a core of paranoia in all of us. The ego itself is essentially paranoid in nature. Rather than at the level of understanding, we gain access to those basic foundational structures at the level of interpretation. This means we must appreciate how understanding and interpretation are not the same thing. Interpretation accesses these elementary structures not by positing an understanding of the clinical material. Rather than proposing a meaning behind the analysis discourse, the analyst instead raises a question or repeats a phrase. This provides a rare glimpse into Lacan's psychoanalytic techniques, which operates through what is called punctuation. In punctuation, the analyst intervenes by showing the subject that he is saying more than he thinks he is. Not by telling the analysis and the meaning of their discourse, but by repeating some word or phrase back to them. Punctuation may also happen through a moment of silence, an interruption, or most famously by ending the session at a particular moment unexpected to the analysis, but in a manner that leads the analysis to reflect upon their own words that preceded the immediate ending of the session. A second insight regarding psychoanalytic technique is offered in the introductory remarks of Lecture 3. In working through the analytic literature, Lacan is reminded of the life of the analyst who is made to deal with and endure the rubbish dump of utterances that are of doubtful value to the analyst. Beyond the somewhat humorous characterization of how Lacan views much of psychoanalytic theorizing following Freud, we also find a dimension of what is involved in analytic training. Lacan states that this feeling is one the analyst is accustomed to overcoming. One of the ways the analyst does this is by coming to terms with the fact that their understanding of what is being said is fundamentally a misrecognition of it. For psychoanalysis is not concerned with the supposed underlying meaning of what was said in terms of what the analysis supposedly meant, but instead with what was actually said. In other words, those distinct material signifiers that were employed. The meaning that interests the analyst is, so to speak, the internal meaning of the signifiers themselves as they are in relation to other signifiers. 
This emphasis on the signifier becomes especially relevant in the case of delusions, whereby the signifier takes on a particular and extraordinary emphasis, one that can be manifested as a neologism. A neologism is an invented utterance that's not integrated into ordinary language. To appreciate the function of such neologisms, Lacan reminds us of the theory of language he inherits from Saussure, though in a somewhat altered manner, as Lacan's approach tends to emphasize the disjuncture between signifier and and signified rather than their unity under the sign. The signifier is the material of language, the elemental phonological dimension that is independent from any meaning or reference. Nonetheless, signifiers do ordinarily aim at particular signifieds. The signified is itself not the thing or object in reality, but the meaning something has for a subject. The key point here is that signifiers usually function within a differentiated signifying chain and that though separated, the signifier is anchored to signified in what Lacan will later call in this seminar quilting points. In psychosis, these quilting points are absent, so signifiers become thoroughly untethered from signifieds. In such a situation, there is an excess of intuition in which the signifier constantly slides and is reshaped, while meaning is formulated in terms of a repeated, stereotyped insistence. So in paranoia, we have the coming together of an excess and an emptiness that acts as a weight upon the subject's discourse, eventually settling down and bringing meaning to a halt, resulting in the manifested form of a delusion. Lacan concludes that the phenomenology of psychosis is to be approached from the register of speech. What then is speech? Well, first, to speak is to speak to others. Second, the subject receives their own speech back from the other in an inverted form. This structure allows us to understand false speech. He then goes on to develop two cases of such speech, what he calls fides and faint. Fides is foundational speech that commits oneself to the other, thereby establishing our own position. He provides the examples of the statements, you are my woman and you are my master. The first utterance may position the speaking subject in the role of husband and the second as slave. So we see here how in this kind of full speech, one receives back that message in such a way as to establish one's own position. The faint or lying speech is the way in which we recognize that there's a subject to subject relation going on here and how it contrasts with a subject to object relation. This is because we only truly know we're dealing with another subject when we are aware of the possibility of being deceived. So in speaking to this other, and thus making the other speak back to us, we're dealing here not with the little other, but the big other, the absolute other, who is absolute due to being what is unknowable. This unknowability is demonstrated in both the fetus and faint. For an uttering, you are my wife, or you are my master, we can't be so sure that the inverted message received from the other is a lie or not. And that is what can in fact make it most deceptive. In the case of paranoic subjects, when they speak, they speak about themselves as an object, that is, about their knowledge. And the source of that knowledge is the little other, which is the very counter to the big other in which that big other is what is fundamentally unknown. And so we have a kind of dialectic here uh, between little other and big other, or between knowledge and the unknowable. In the relation to the imaginary other specifically, there is what Lacan calls the dialectic of jealousy, which is a primary moral manifestation of communication. Uh, there's a special kind of identification with the other where a child may hit another child on the left side of the face and then the striking child touches the right side of his own face crying out in imagined pain. Transitivism illustrates the confusion that can happen between ego and other in these imaginary identifications. And it's in these identifications that inaugurates the dialectic of jealousy. This is because the other is the source of my my own ego and my desire. Consequently, also the source of my alienation and a rival for that mutually desired object. 
So prior to that imaginary identification, the subject begins life as a, an incoherent collection of desires expressed by what Lacan calls the fragmented body. The imaginary relation provides an initial synthesis of such desires through the image of myself, which is located in the other who functions as my gravitational center, conferring upon me my imaginary unity as an ego. But this synthesis comes at the price of my alienation. In other words, I'm constituted as a whole only so long as I exclude from my subjectivity that which is unacceptable to the other. This emphasis on alienation is really important here, for although all subjects pass through this alienation, psychosis is characterized by a more extreme version of it. Now, ordinarily, this primitive competition and aggressive character of the imaginary relation is overcome through speech, which establishes a kind of agreement that divvies up objects. This is mine, that is yours. Much like how a parent enters in after siblings have been fighting over their toys and imposes rules that establishes a truce between the siblings. Nonetheless, Lacan adds, this primordial imaginary relation always bears a trace in later forms of discourse and is in a precarious situation since that agreement that's been formed in and through speech can be undone at any point. So now thinking about this in terms of paranoia, who is this subject speaking to and what is this subject talking about? What is the structure of the being that speaks to this subject? Lacan indicates that we're dealing with the S with a question mark, by which he means the S as in the abbreviation of the subject, but more specifically, it's the unconscious subject, the S as in the German word that is translated as the SA in French and the ID in English. Yet acknowledging that in psychosis it's the unconscious subject that speaks and that it's speaking about the ego, that's not sufficient yet to consider how it speaks and the structure of paranoid discourse in general as it pertains to that dialectic between little and big other. I don't think we're given a full answer to it here, but we are provided an insightful illustration as to how this discourse can function. In volume 12 of the standard edition, Freud argues that the principal forms of paranoia can be represented as the contradiction of a single proposition, which is thought in terms of the case of Schreber. Now, it seems Freud assumed that the core conflict of paranoia among males is a wishful fantasy of loving a man. Lacan notably distances himself from Freud on this point. And if you read that section, pages, I think, 62 to 64 in volume 12, even Freud slightly backtracks, stating that there's further investigation that might be necessary to consider whether this core conflict is limited to a particular variant of paranoia or not. Regardless, the example is still illustrative, even if its generalizability is highly dubious. So Freud offers up the utterance, I, a man, love him, a man. This proposition for Freud may undergo four different contradictions. Lacan only addresses three of them in his lecture, two of which will be addressed here. I'll begin with the contradiction Lacan mentions first, though it's the third one addressed by Freud. I'll also use an example that I think applies well in this situation, one drawn from the 1999 film American Beauty, specifically the character Colonel Frank Fitz, played by Chris Cooper, who is the father of the teenage boy Ricky Fitz. First, the utterance undergoes a contradiction of the grammatical subject. We move from I love him to it is not I who love the man, she loves him. Herein we find the basis of the delusion of jealousy. One suspects the woman is in relation to all those men who the subject himself is tempted to love. This is an inverted alienation, Lacan says, in which the paranoiac is identified with his wife, who becomes the messenger for his feelings, concerning the indefinite number of men who he could have loved. In the case of Colonel Fitz, it's not an inversion of gender, but rather of roles, as he suspects his son of having some kind of sexual relation with the main character of the story, Lester Burnham. The third contradiction, the last one that Lacan addresses, represents a contradiction of the verb. We move from I love him to I do not love him, I hate him. And, it will be added, I hate him because he persecutes Persecutes me. This utterance establishes persecutory delusions. Here we find not an inverted alienation but a converted one, whereby my love for the other becomes my hatred, which gets further transformed into this other persecuting me, providing me a reason to hate him. 
This delusion is particularly notable for what Lacan calls the profound deterioration of the entire system of the other and the extensive nature of interpretations imposed upon the world, giving rise to an imaginary disturbance to the maximum. And that point is perhaps best illustrated by returning to the case of Colonel Fitz, who not only expresses intense homophobic anger, but upon being rebuffed in his advance toward Lester himself, undoubtedly feels intense hatred and persecutory ideation toward him, which ultimately leads to a deadly outcome. Much more remains to be developed here, and the next video will continue to unfold this elementary structure of psychosis by distinguishing its respective characteristics from that of neurosis. I want to thank the following for supporting this channel on Patreon. If you wish to support this work on Patreon, the link is below in the description. You can also support this work by liking and sharing this video, as well as subscribing to my channel. As always, thank you for watching, and until next time, be well.